My guest today is Emily Cooper. Emily, how are you today? Doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. I'm staying uh, safe and hibernating and inside, but uh, I cannot complain. <laughs> Absolutely. There are worse places to be in Chicago winter. Yeah. Uh, what do you do in Chicago? So I work for the Illinois Science and Technology Institute. been working for this organization for over six years now. I'm um, born and raised in Evanston, so I've been in the Chicago area a long time and really pleased to be impacting the education system in the state. Uh, tell me about the Illinois Science and Technology Institute, which I'm just going to call ISTI from yeah. now on. <laughs> what it's is that? <laughs> it's much more palatable. Um, so it is a STEM education focused organization. Oh, and, really st and STEM is? Yes. Great, great point. We work in so many acronyms sometimes, it's good to break them down. Science, technology, engineering, and math. And in fact, we could include STEAM in that, which includes the arts as well. Okay. Um, and what we're really focused on is being a bridge between what's going on in the real world, in industry, and in the classroom, so that we're preparing students to be a part of this more inclusive, talented uh, STEM pipeline in the state of Illinois. So that's our overarching larger goal is to build a more diverse, inclusive STEM talent pipeline in the state by connecting classrooms with real world. OK, and the reason that I know about STEM or I know about ISTI is because of something called the STEM challenge, which I've been uh, I've been involved in just for the last couple of years, but you're much more involved in it. Can you tell me about that? Yeah. Absolutely. So ISTI has two programs, one of which is the STEM Challenge. It's been around since 2013-14 academic year. We work in academic years in our mind. Um, and it, again, is to connect schools with companies, with industry. So this year we have 13 companies across the state. So we have companies down in East St. Louis on the Missouri border. Uh, we have them up in kind of the Waukegan, North Chicago area, a good cohort in Chicago, everything in between. Um, and we go to companies and we say, would you like to impact the STEM talent pipeline? And they say, absolutely, how can we help? So we get mentors from the company who serve uh, as mentors for the students. And we get them in a room and we say, what is going on in your industry? If you were to hire a project team, if you were to hire someone tomorrow, what might they work on? What problems are facing your industry? What's something that could be improved? What's something that's top of mind? So we don't go to these companies and say, what would be fun for students to work on? We don't cook something up. We want it to be authentic and something right. that if you were to hire these high school students, they would actually be working on. And then we partner these companies with up to four high schools. So some are really dedicated in one high school. Some have a few high schools that they work with. And we present this problem statement, this authentic industry problem statement to teachers. And then they present it to their classrooms. And then we have mentors from the company that work alongside the students, both in person in a traditional year and virtually through our mentor matching engine platform that I can talk about to work with students on an ongoing basis. It's to solve this problem, which is always a big, messy, interdisciplinary problem. There is no right answer. So that's really a new way of learning and a new way of teaching for our teachers because they're used to presenting something to the students and the students are supposed to give an immediate answer. And there is a correct answer that they're searching for. And in this, it's design thinking process. It's human centered design. They are taking this big problem and they're figuring out how to break it down and what user they want to solve it for and what angle they want to go uh, with. So they can use their innovation, their creativity. If you're a student that is really good at art, you can help to design an idea. If you're a student that's a confident public speaker, we need you to share your idea back to the company. So everybody's skill set has a role. And then through that long term engagement, it's over the course of a semester, weekly engagement with the mentor, we are seeing students build workforce skills. So they learn how to communicate with somebody externally. So they're talking to their teacher and they're used to talking to their peers and to their family members, but they're not used to talking to a professional and getting that authentic feedback. So they're building that communication. They're working in a team, so they're learning how to collaborate. They're learning how to meet deadlines. So they're building those workforce skills along the way of solving this real authentic industry problem. Uh, can you give me an example of some of the industry problems that students are solving? Absolutely. So this year we have everything from Northrop Grumman does a military defense challenge to John Deere is a new partner for us this year uh, to healthcare companies in the state to an energy company. 
So for example, one of our energy companies down in the East St. Louis region, they're asking students to reimagine a way to use coal ash in, to improve their community. So what, hmm. is, what are sustainable materials? Um, how can they be reused? How to, do they come to be? Everything from that to students that are being asked to look at medication adherence. So your medicine is only as effective as you taking it correctly the correct dose mm -hmm. for the correct time. How do we get people to do that? Why are the reasons they might not be doing that? To construction-based challenges, asking students to reimagine the construction side of the, the future and look at ways to make equipment safer and to have more sensor technology so that things are working more effectively. Uh, so the uh, students and the teachers and the mentors, they're working together to solve this problem. Um, are they what are they doing? Are they are they building software? Are they building hardware? Are they just uh, coming up with ideas and brainstorming all of the above? What's what's the That's job great, of students at the end of this? Great question. So for ISCI, it's Thank about best over product. So we hope that students come up with a really great idea, but again, we want it to be an authentic process. So we ask our mentors, tell huh? the students if their solution isn't feasible. Tell the students okay. if that would never work at a Microsoft or at a Caterpillar. Guide them to great resources, help them to critically think, are there other solutions that are similar out there? Why is this the best solution for their user group? And go through that true design thinking process. At the end, it can be whatever they've authentically come up with. So we had students in the past who were asked to tackle the patient journey for adults with Alzheimer's. And they went to the source. They wanted to know how adults with Alzheimer's interacted with one another, interacted with the world, so they could solve something for that specific user group. And in doing so, they decided to go with a board game that would trigger certain synapses oh. in the brain. Um, so students tend to immediately go to apps. That's how they interact with the world. That's how they solve yeah. problems. But sometimes they have to go back to the drawing board and realize for their specific user group, that isn't the best solution. But we have seen students create apps. Uh, we had students down in Williamsfield, a small rural community outside of Peoria. They work with a solar energy company, and now there is a solar energy community in Williamsfield, Illinois. So they actually saw their project through to fruition. So it can get as real oh, wow. as really implemented in the community, or it can be an idea and you learned what was feasible for that company and how to solve a problem like you would solve within the company. So it's there's a broad scope of what our students come up with. Oh, wow. And some of those are high tech and some of them are low tech. And Absolutely. I love the fact that uh, the, the students and the idea live beyond just this one semester of STEM challenge. Absolutely. Yep. No, it exists in the community today. We were really proud to see that. Uh, how, how many schools are involved in this program? This year we have 20 high schools, um, huh? usually ranges between about 18 to 25 high schools, again, spanning the state. So we work with Decatur, Peoria area, um, lots in Chicago, again, East St. Louis, Round Lake. Um, so we really try to serve the full state of Illinois. This year we are in Moline and Rock Island for the first time. It's a new region of the state for us. Uh, really, we're looking for students that are excited about this opportunity that are traditionally underrepresented in STEM and who don't have opportunities like this. So these might be companies that exist in their backyard. They might have gone past them several times. They have no idea what goes on inside that building or that there are several different career opportunities that exist for them. So you can work in legal or marketing and work for a Microsoft or for a Caterpillar or for a John Deere. So they start to see the different opportunities and the ways they can combine their passions and their STEM opportunities that exist in their backyard. How do the uh, schools get involved? Do they come to you or do you find them? That's a great question. So every year we have a waiting list of schools. It is a supply and demand model. Uh, we try to serve as many as possible. We have a few ways we connect with them. Sometimes a company says to us, help us find schools in our community that are excited mm. for this opportunity. We want teachers that are really looking for something like this that will grasp onto it because for teachers, it's a year long process. We do a professional development in the fall. We do a planning period with them. We do mentor training and then things get started in earnest in January. Um, so for teachers, it's a big commitment, but if they're uh. looking for connections like this and opportunities to bring their community into their classroom, we want to work with them. Uh, so it's either us going into a community and saying we have this great company that wants to impact students, that wants to help them build STEM skills. Do you have any teachers looking for this opportunity? 
or sometimes we have companies that already have a connection to a school that they're looking to deepen. Okay. And you said there's a waiting list of schools. What, what's the what's the limiting factor that uh, Lim on your end? The limiting factor is having enough companies uh, to serve. Okay. So again, companies typically take on between one and four high schools, depending on the size of the company and the capacity. It's also okay. a commitment for mentors. Again, there's weekly communication yeah. and it's through our mentoring platform primarily, but we are asking them to, over the course of an entire semester, communicate weekly with students, provide them consistent mentorship. Um, so we're looking for companies that are looking to have that high dosage, high impact, long-term engagement with students. Um, but yeah, the limiting factor is companies. So hopefully each year we grow in the number of companies and we're always looking to bring more on to serve more schools. What are we talking about? 20 schools so far. Is that how many students is that? So this year it is about 900 students. Oh, wow. That's yeah. a lot. Um, and uh, the mentoring, is that uh, mostly in person or online or, or traditionally? How does that work? I imagine, I imagine it's changed a bit this year. Yes, traditionally it is a mix of in person and virtual. So back in 2012, we built our proprietary platform, the Mentor Matching Engine. It's a way to safely and securely connect high school students with mentors on an ongoing basis. So one of the things that's unique about ISTI that we're most proud of, again, is that high dosage high impact. So one-off STEM opportunities are really valuable in their own way, but we know that our STEM skills in our students grow over time and that they build their confidence in their STEM skills through ongoing mentorship. But we also understand that the professionals are busy. They have work, they have families. It's not possible to get into the classroom every single week as much as they would like to. Okay. So we build a platform to facilitate that. So students create their projects online. Teachers are in every project for safety. We background check our mentors and we add them into the project. And then students and mentors can communicate back and forth through discussion, through video conferencing. It's really intuitive and it's a great way for them to stay connected and for everybody to have that project management piece. You can track what's going on in the project. Um, so we built that platform years ago in order to help facilitate this high dosage mentorship. And it has come in very handy this year in terms of us pivoting to be entirely virtual we're very lucky that we already had a virtual platform that was trusted by our students, mentors, and teachers to help facilitate this. But in a traditional year, we would start the program with what we call a kickoff, where the mentors go in person to the classroom. There would be a field trip, which we call a site visit to the company, so they can see what goes on at the company. Typically, they get a career fair, a tour, and be able to see their mentors in that professional environment. And then when the students present at the end, they would either do so at the company or the mentors would come to the school. So there's typically at least three in-person engagements. But again, we're lucky to have a trusted platform where we could pivot quickly to a fully virtual year to keep everyone safe. So is that the big change uh, since the pandemic started is you just dropped the in-person and you're just continuing more of the, the virtual part? Is that Absolutely. right? Absolutely, and we typically have a big showcase to celebrate our student innovation and, and the solutions that obviously has also pivoted to virtual. So it's become a fully virtual year to keep everyone safe. Our professional development and mentor training was also virtual. Um, but again, for us, we're very lucky in that it was a yeah. smaller pivot. It took away those few in-person engagements, but our mentors and students are used to communicating primarily through our virtual platform. Oh, tell me about that showcase at the end. Is it is this a uh, a contest? Is there a winner? It is not a contest for a few reasons. Um, one is that we heard that that tends to dissuade students who are already traditionally underrepresented in STEM. The other reason, again, is because our industries are so different. So it's really hard to compare what students right. came up with for Northrop Grumman or for Caterpillar with what students came up with for AbV or uh, right. for John. It's all just so different. So it's really just a celebration of student innovation. It gets slightly competitive. There's a two tier process, I suppose. So there's what we call a share out. So typically an entire classroom of high school students is tackling this problem from this company and they all share out. So they, they're working in teams. So maybe you have six teams in a classroom. They would all share out to their mentors. One team is to present at that final showcase. So okay. it's not te technically a competition, but we do, for the sake of, of time and being able to showcase all the companies and all the schools, we select one team per school. Okay. You mentioned underrepresented students. Is there a mission? Do, do you, are you trying to get more underrepresented students involved in this? 
Absolutely. We believe in equity in STEM education. So we want to make sure that we are providing these opportunities to students who haven't had them before. Um, we do a really robust post program evaluation each year and around 75% of our students annually tell us this is the first time they've ever interacted with a professional on an ongoing mm -hmm. basis where they've ever had a professional mentor. And that access piece is really important. You can't be what you can't see. So it's important to us that our mentor pool is diverse, that we are working with students from all over the state from different socioeconomic backgrounds that we are making sure that we are bringing females into STEM and helping to build the confidence and the skills they already possess. Um, so absolutely equity in education and access is really important and underscores all of the work that we do. Uh, um, I I got involved in this. My friend Adam was already involved. He recruited me a couple of years ago. You're nodding because I think you know Adam. Yes, I love <laughs> 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 and uh, <clears throat> but um, but I hadn't heard of it before. How, how do people get involved either as uh, teachers, students, uh, companies, mentors? How, what's what's the how do we get the word out? That's a great question. So it really started through ISTC. So we have an umbrella organization, the Illinois Science and Technology Technology Coalition, which again shortened for uh, ease. So ISTC, and they've been around for years, and they're a member-driven organization. And something their members had in common was wanting to, again, impact the STEM talent pipeline to make it more inclusive, to make it more diverse, and to help students build those skills. And so out of that came the Institute back in 2012. And so it started with some of the coalition members that were already supporting the Illinois STEM ecosystem. Um, since then, again, we have been lucky to have word of mouth. People come to our showcase, they see the impact this is having on students, and they say, why are we not doing this? I want to get involved. But we also are recruiting companies all the time based on student needs. If we have schools that we feel like really need this opportunity, we will go to companies in their area. If there are areas of the state where we aren't working with any students, we will go and we will try to work with those companies. So. Um, we're thinking all the time strategically about how, again, to reach students who don't have these opportunities. And typically, there are great companies in the area that are also looking to help to build the future workforce and let students know the opportunities that exist for them in their community. Um, in terms of schools and teachers, same. Um, we have schools who hear about us through other schools, which is amazing, and come to us and say, hey, I want my students to have this opportunity. Um, or we're able to go to school districts and say, great news, we have a company um, doing innovative work in your community and they want to provide this opportunity to your school district. Let us talk to some teachers and see who it might be a good fit for. Excellent. Um, is there anything we haven't talked about that you want to share? Um, I don't think so. I think, you know, we we hope that you'll you'll check out all of the great work going on ICI. Again, we're always looking for new companies to get involved. Um, our mentor matching engine platform, I guess, is the only other thing we haven't talked about in that it's also its own program. So if you're not a school that's working directly with a company on an authentic industry problem statement, you can use the mentor matching engine as a teacher. You put your students on the platform. They create a project of their choosing, so an authentic research project. And then we have mentors on the platform that are there to work with those students. So they're from organizations across the nation because it's a fully virtual platform. Mm -hmm. And they fill out their expertise and what research categories they feel comfortable mentoring in. And students select the research categories they're looking for a mentor in. We background check the mentors and then they're in a pool of mentors visible for students to work with on long term projects. So uh, we're really proud of that program, too. We have 23 high schools, over a thousand students in that program, and that is growing all the time. It, it's a flexible way to get involved because we have a mentor pool waiting to work with students. Excellent. Well, Emily, thank you so much for your time yeah, and uh, good luck with this year's program. Thank you. Appreciate it. And you stay safe. I think something that's really unique about the STEM challenges and the mentor matching engine is how much technology is threaded through. Um, so you sometimes don't realize as a student, you say, I'm not good at computer science. I'm not strong in technology. And then we say, well, you're on your cell phone. You're using a virtual platform to connect with your mentor. You've probably used AI all the time with a chat bot or Siri on your phone. You didn't even think about it. So they are actually more friendly with technology. Technology is their friend. They just don't realize that they have those skills because it's so embedded in their day to day.